Come on, let's give him a praise tonight. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we give you glory and honor tonight, God. Hallelujah. 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 Well, good evening, good evening. It's good to see everybody in the house tonight. Greetings to those of you joining with us via live streaming. We welcome you and thank you for coming online with us. It's going to be a powerful time in the Word. Uh, those of you in house, you can be seated. Uh, it's going to be a powerful time in the Word. Uh, first thing I want to mention is, uh, as you can tell, our pastors are not here with us, um, but I want you to know that they will be here this Sunday. Uh, we'll be continuing in the series on relationships. It's been a powerful series. Uh, I encourage you, I encourage you, invite friends, family members. You know, how many, how many people know uh, relationships, wisdom on relationships is needed? I mean, if you may not need it right now, you'll need it later. A family member may need it later. A coworker may need it later. So I encourage you, invite somebody out uh, so that they can be blessed. You know, the word is being poured into you. Your life is being transformed. Your life is being changed. But guess what? You have, uh, there's other people that need this word as well. So I encourage you to invite somebody out uh, so that they can receive what's coming forth. Um, tonight, we're going to be uh, dealing with something that's uh, pretty near and dear to me. I think it's going to be a good time in the word. I hope you bought your Bible. I hope you bought a pen, a notepad, electronic device, whatever you can use to write down something, uh, because it, it's, it's important for you to take notes, uh, not just because I'm talking. I think any time the word of God is coming forth, it's important to take notes. You know, many times we know more than we understand, and then we can understand more than we believe, and then it's important that we walk in what it is that we believe. You know, God told Joshua, he said, meditate in the word day and night. He said, then you will be able to observe, to do the word of God. So to just hear once is, is good. You know, I applaud you for coming out on a Wednesday night. I applaud you for tuning in on a Wednesday night because, uh, you know, many people uh, may not have made that decision, but you've made that decision. But I also encourage you to continue in the word, continue in the word that you hear, because that's where you're going to see fruit from the word. It's not just seed that we want. It's not just the seed. The seed of the word of God is powerful. We know it's powerful, uh, but it's the fruit that we want to come from that seed. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray, and we're going to dig into uh, what we have here tonight. Father God, I thank you right now for everyone that's here under the sound of my voice, whether they're in this building, whether they're tuning in via live stream, whether they're catching this uh, hours, days, weeks, months later via a replay, Father, or YouTube, Father. We thank you right now, God, that this word, Father, that comes forth, that it won't be me, God, but it'll be you, Father, that I decrease, I yield to you, God, that I can be a vessel in your hand to minister to your sheep and to your people, God, that the word that you desire for us to receive, God, will come forth, God, without any hindrance, without any clutter, God, without any distraction, we thank you right now, Father, that your word shall come forth with clarity, God. I thank you for utterance and boldness to speak your word, God. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, what we're going to be talking about here tonight is meekness, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I often hear Pastor Derek talk about meekness, and he, he mentions meekness, he you know, he mentions myself, he mentions a few other, like uh, Deacon David, Deacon Canarius, I think uh, I heard Deacon Kathy, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you hear your name, uh, <laughs> you hear yourself uh, referred to uh, concerning characteristics and traits of, of God, uh, because, uh, you know, what, one, and, I, and I often wonder what, you know, what these other folks are thinking, but myself, when I hear myself mentioned, um, it's, it's, it's just a thing, it's like, it, it's, not that, it, it's, it's, it's not that I don't see some of the examples and the demonstration of meekness and uh, different things that I may carry out, but it's, it's that I'm also aware of other things that I'm working on. And, you know, and you're aware of, at times, the internal dialogue that, although you may have carried out and, and demonstrated or displayed meekness at that time, uh, there was some internal dialogue that you had to, you know, you had to win that battle to carry it out. And then there's other times when you lose that battle. And, you know, it's those things that is like, 
uh, it, it's, it's something that I just want to encourage you and implore you to come along on this journey with me here tonight. Because uh, one of the things you're going to see is that it's, meekness is such a powerful trait. It's such, uh, it's such a powerful, uh, it's, it's also a fruit of the Spirit. It's, 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 it's a powerful too that if, if, if we employ it, our lives can be transformed. Our relationships can be transformed. And I'll tell you this, our perspective of how we see things in this world, how we see things in our families, how we see things concerning our finances, our perspective will be transformed and we'll be able to walk in the things that God has for us. So come, come with me. Let's go and look at Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start with talking about what is meekness. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, if you need a Bible, uh, if you need a Bible, <laughs> due to COVID, we won't be handing it out, but uh, look on with your neighbor if you need a Bible. Uh, or look on the screens. We'll have it on the screens for you, if you need, if, uh, so you can follow along. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, media, if you can get this in Amplified uh, Classic, uh, and it says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which, it says, the work which his presence within accomplishes. That's so important, and, and I, want, I want you to I want you to digest that because we're going to revisit this when we start talking about how to walk in meekness. But it says, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, and then it starts label, uh, listing out the, fruit of the, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, <coughs> benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and humility. Now, those three right there is uh, the Amplified is, is expounding on what meekness is. It says gentleness, that's what meekness is, and humility. And many times uh, the new, in, in the New Testament, it's translated between one of those three words, either gentleness, meekness, or humility. Self-control, uh, self-restraint, uh, continence, uh, against such things, there is no law that can, uh, that can bring a change. I'll bring that, uh, let me read it here because I don't have my contact, sorry. <laughs> uh, against, such there, against such things, there is no law uh, that can bring a charge. So you see the other two words of gentleness and humility. And uh, I'm also going to read for you the Merriam-Webster uh, definition of meekness. And, and it's very interesting. Like when you, look at, uh, when you look at those different fruits of the Spirit, Many, time when you look, many times when you look at them, they're not, uh, you know, those aren't things that you go run on the line and say, hey, I sign up for forbearance. You know, hey, you know, I sign up for humility. It's like they're, they're not the most appealing and exciting things, but they bring and they yield a huge harvest if we will uh, employ them. So listen to what the Marion Webster's uh, definition says. It says, uh, deficient in spirit and courage. See, it, it's, it's, this, this is why it's, there's no wonder why there's a shortage of meekness in the earth, because this is, this is the, the view that many people have on meekness, that, that, it's, that when you're meek, you're deficient in spirit, you're deficient in courage. It says not violent, which that is good, uh, and it says, uh, but also not strong. So deficient, lacking courage, and not strong, is, is, these are a couple of the definitions from the Merriam-Webster, but it also says, uh, and I like this one, it says, enduring injury with patience and without resentment. So in other words, being able to endure uh, what you, whatever it is that you may be going through and not have resentment and to do it with patience. Is, is the definition of meekness. Now, the, uh, the Greek translation of, of meek, and uh, I'll spell it for you, is P-R-A-O-S. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look up a word on, your, on the internet, and uh, you can have it sounded out for you, so I don't, 
This is the way they tell me it sounds. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to be uh, fancy up here. I'm just telling you this is the way they tell me it sounds. Padows. So I know it's spelled P-R-A-O-S, which sounds like pros, but it's padows. And it refers to mildness, gentleness of spirit, or humility. So meekness uh, is humility towards God and towards others. So I'm going to start defining it for you. Uh, in the easiest terms I know, and then also let the Bible define it for you. So it's having the right or the power to do something, but refraining for the benefit of someone else. It says having the right or the power to do something, yet you refrain for the benefit of someone else. This, this is what meekness is. Now, let's uh, look at Ephesians chapter 4. So we're going we're gonna to hit a number of scriptures. You know, one, one, of the things that, uh, one of the things that happens to me is like when I, when I read the scriptures, it, it, just, it just refreshes and, it, it, and it's, uh, it renews my perspective. Sometimes it, uh, it returns me to a perspective that I may have found that was slipping away because many times when you're inundated with information and inundated with information and that information is not founded on the word of God, it, you, you may not know it, but it's seed. Yeah. And that seed is beginning to change your perspective. Right. And, it, and it begins what it, many times it's not that we, uh, it's not that we find ourselves off doing something that's, you know, that's crazy or out there, but many times we just find ourselves pulling back and, and not as fervent and not as, uh, not as having a strong, um, uh, a strong commitment to the things that we once believed because we continue to, you know, we just hear a bunch of information and in and, and, and today's society, there's just so many uh, there's so many ways that we're inundated with information, whether it's TV, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's internet, whether it's YouTube, whether it's social media, all these different things, uh, you know, whether it's coworkers, you know, it's your, your, the environment, the people that you, that you may be around on a regular basis. All these different avenues of information begin to come in and bombard our spirit. And, you know, this is what the scripture said about Lot. It said his righteous soul was vexed because he was in the midst of perverseness and seeing it day in and day out, it began to vex the, his righteous soul. And uh, it, it's, it's important for us to realize that our soul, not our spirit, but our soul can be vexed as well. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about the soul here a little bit. So Ephesians 4, we said, right? Uh, it says, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, this is Paul, uh, I, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, the job wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now, the first thing that stood out to me, and uh, the Apostle Paul has used this uh, kind of this little opening many times where he calls himself the prisoner of the Lord or the prisoner of the gospel. And, and it's, it's, it's so interesting to me because, uh, you know, as we look back now at the work that the Apostle Paul has done, we esteem him highly. And, and, and we see that there's so much revelation that came forth out of his life. But when you look at his view of himself, he called himself a prisoner of the Lord. And that's, you know, many times that's, that's very contrary to how, because, you know, we're free in Christ, we have the grace, and all those things are very true, but there's also an element of us sacrificing for God. You know, as a born-again believer, don't, don't be deceived into believing that you are not called to lay things down for God, that you're not called to put your ways down and pick up his ways. You know, when you consider, you know, and, and this, this is not work-based religion that I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is actually relationship. Tell me a close relationship that you have that does not require sacrifice. A good one. A healthy one. Yet, 
many times believers start to feel like there's no sacrifice that's required. That is just, you know, whatever. And God still loves us. I'm not talking about love, uh, but yet I'm actually talking about love. I'm talk- so his love required him to give his son. It cost a sacrifice. Yet on our end, somehow it's being uh, taught to us that our love to God doesn't require sacrifice. And it does. It does. It's, it's the only it's the only natural response. And it's not out of obligation. It's out of a heartfelt gratitude of what God has done for us. When, when you consider all that God has done for you, when you consider where and how God found you, whether you were down and out or whether you were up and out, guess what? We were still out. We were not in his righteousness. And it took us bowing our knee and accepting him as Lord and Savior. And by doing that, we accepted his sacrifice. So he died to self so that we can live in him. And guess what? We got to die to ourselves to live for him. Go with me to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. So we're going to look at a number of scriptures here. So that's why I said I hope you're taking notes. Uh, and it'll give you something that you can go back and reflect on and look at. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love in any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having this same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, uh, unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So that's exactly what I was explaining. When you look at the sacrifice of Christ, and, and, and this, this is a good picture of meekness. Because while meekness is humbling ourselves and it's, it's humility, uh, another way to look at meekness is it, it's power under control. When, when you look at Christ, it says he considered himself equal with God, yet he took on the form of a servant. So he realized that he realized who he was. And one of the things you're going to, one of the revelations I, I pray that you catch today, in order for you to truly be able to walk in meekness consistently, is going to require you to know who you are. It's going, to remind, it's going to require for you to know who God is, for you to know who you are in God, and for you to have a biblical worldview if you're going to walk in meekness. Otherwise, it, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult to consistently do it. So look at this, meekness. Christ's willingness and discipline to humble himself up under the will of the Father while equally understanding who he is. Knowing he is the son of God, yet he chose servanthood. So the meekness that Christ demonstrated was power under control. Yet he, so uh, he, he had the power to, like he said, no man takes my life. I laid down my life. I believe pastor referenced that scripture on Sunday. But uh, no, no one was able to take from him, but yet he chose to lay down his life. He chose to serve God in this manner so that we would have the, lamb, the sacrificial lamb. So let's go here to Psalms 25. And as, as you're going there, I just want to share a few things. 
So when, 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 you're, when you're talking about meekness and you're talking about uh, meekness when it comes to uh, relationships, uh, especially when you're talking about serious relationships, covenant relationships, you know, it, it's going to require for us to adapt to one another. It's going to require for us to prefer one another. It's going to require for us to uh, esteem, as the scripture says here, to esteem uh, their things higher than your own. And, uh, you know, in a healthy marriage, there's a lot of give and take of that. And I say in, in a healthy marriage, but I will also say that there's seasons of marriages or any close covenant relationship where one person may find themselves uh, basically laying down their will more often than the other. Because there's just seasons in relationships where uh, somebody, whether they're going through something emotionally or whatever it is that they may be dealing with, that uh, the other party finds themselves having to continually to uh, pick up their cross. But in order for that person to continue to pick up their cross, they're going to have to have a revelation of serving the other person. And when you begin to view relationships in terms of serving rather than demanding what it is that we feel we need from that other person, then it becomes an easier, uh, it becomes easier to walk in that relationship and make that relationship smooth even during hard times. You know, there's, there's the enduring the storms of relationships, but then there's also an element within relationships uh, where you have meekness that it, it, it makes it enjoyable. So when you talk about serving somebody, you know, it's, you begin to serve them to see that smile on their face, to do the thing that uh, you know they're going to enjoy, you know they're going to appreciate, you know, when you're in a relationship. And that's a level of meekness, too, because why? Because you're serving them. You're looking and saying, okay, what is it that I can do to, uh, to make things light for them? What is it that I can do to make them happy? What is it that I can do to, uh, to, to put a smile on their face? These are all things where you're what you're considering somebody else rather than only thinking about ourselves. And this is, this is the approach that, uh, that we have to adopt if we want to have healthy and vibrant relationships. You know, one, one of the things, it, it was, it's, it's very interesting when, uh, when my wife and I got together, uh, it's interesting because we didn't meet when we were born again, yet we, I, I feel we made good decisions. <laughs> we made a good decision to select each other. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel, uh, yeah, she's nodding her head, okay. So we, <laughs> you know, we made a good decision. And the interesting thing is, is not being born again. So finding Christ afterwards and then seeing somebody willing to receive the word that's being preached. This is such a huge thing because when, when you're talking about meekness, there's, there's, you know, there's an element of coming up under. There's, there's an element of being able to hear the word and say, you know what? That's something I need to change to. That's something that I need to humble myself and see, you know what? I don't have that. And, you know, and this, this, is, uh, this is good for, for singles as well is, uh, when, when you're, even when you're courting somebody or dating somebody, uh, when, when you begin to see that uh, there's an area in their life that they need to grow in and yet the word is being preached and you see them unwilling to come up under that word that is being preached, that's, that's something that tells you that, hey, there may be some challenges. Or if you go to premarital counseling, you're sitting down with Elder Lori and she says, hey, uh, you know, brother so-and-so, I think you need to consider this. And then, you know, they just walk away when you guys leave, and they're like, you know, they can't nobody tell me what to do. Th those, those are things that you need to pause and you need to consider because, you know, while you guys may be happy at that time, and, you know, and, and you guys may laugh that off and say, <laughs> but guess what? Two years, five years, six years down the line, there's going to come a time when you need somebody with an authoritative voice that can speak into both either of your lives at a time or both of your lives that you're willing to come up under to save you from yourself. And it's, it's, it's so vital that we each have people in our lives that we're able to hear the word and begin to look at ourselves and examine ourselves based upon that word that's coming forth from that person and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to need to change. And that takes humility. 
So we said we're going to go to Psalm 25. So why meekness? This doesn't sound like any fun. You know, I don't feel like coming up under and doing all that. Uh, Psalm 25. I, I want you to know there's benefits to meekness. There's benefits to, to being meek. I know from the definition we saw in Marion Webster's and from the, the world's perspective, it's just, you know, you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to put up with that. You know, you're weak. You know, you're not strong. You know, you're, you're deficient. You know, this, this is the perspective that the world would give. But look at the benefits that the, the scripture tells us. Psalm 25, we're going to hit a few uh, scriptures in Psalm. It says, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his ways. So when you're talking about being able to be led by God, it's going to require meekness. Why? Because meekness is humbling ourselves. It's, it's hard to lead somebody who's not humble. You know, you can give instructions, but if they're not humble, they're not going to follow those instructions. So how can, you know, when, when you talk about guidance and leading somebody, you're not just talking about giving verbal commands. You're talking about actually like you're, you know, and not comparing you to a pet, but, you know, I'm talking about when you're walking a dog, you're leading them. You're guiding them. You're taking them somewhere. And that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to guide us and lead us, but it requires us to be humble. Psalm 37. Just a few pages over. Or a few swipes over. Psalm 37, verse 11. It says, but the meek shall inherit the earth. This is, you know, what was referenced over in Matthew 5. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I'm telling you, there's such a peace that comes from walking in meekness. There's such a peace because, to be honest with you, when you're not walking in meekness, you're walking in your self-strength. You're walking in your own strength. You're walking in your ability to get things done, your ability to fix this relationship, your ability to get your finances, your ability to, uh, you know, to work out this situation on your job or in your business. You're walking and you're dependent upon your ability and you're striving to get things done. But when you walk in meekness, you're allowing God to lead you. You're allowing God to direct you. And there's a peace that you can rest and trust in God. Let's keep going. Psalm 22. You know, another thing about, it says, the meek shall inherit the earth. You know, in order for there to be an inheritance, something must die. So if we're going to inherit, we're going to have to die to self-will. That, that's, that's what meekness is about. Psalms 140, excuse me. Psalms 22, right? Psalms 22, 26. It says, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him, your heart shall live forever. It says you shall eat and be satisfied. There, there's, there's a contentment that comes with being meek, that you're, you're not always, uh, you know, on this rat race, always reaching and reaching, I got to do this, I got to do this. And you see some people, it's just like they're never satisfied. You know, they, they, you, can see, uh, you can see them get promoted, you can see them get a new house. You can see uh, them get married, but they're never satisfied. And, the satis and that satisfaction comes from humbling ourselves under the Lord and, into, and being in his will. Not so much of, okay, well, yeah, I, I, I think I need to do this. I want to do this. I want, I want, I want, I want. But no, pausing and saying, God, what is it that you want? You know, there, there's, there's, there's a reason why God saved us. Number one for us, because he loves us. But guess what? He wants to reach others through us. And if we're only focused on, I want, I want, I want, not saying that God doesn't want to bless you, not saying that God doesn't want to increase you, not saying that God doesn't want to do things in your lives. But if we're only focused on that, then we're not able to hear and notice when God brings others across our path so that we can minister to them. 
so that we can encourage others. And, and sometimes it's just as simple as your presence, your joy. You know, it's, most times you're not joyful when you're striving to get things done. But when you're walking in the Lord in peace, that, that, it's a witness. People notice it. People see the lightness and they, 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 they recognize the lightness. Like, uh, you know, I think Elder Moore was just commenting on it uh, in, in, in our staff meeting this week. Tish, you see a lightness, you know, and, and she's put under the pressure <laughs> quite often of, hey, Tish, you need this, this, five people pulling on her to do a certain things. But you notice a lightness. It's, it's that meekness, the way that she, she carries herself. It's that lightness. It's a, it's a witness to others that, you know what, man, and, and on many jobs, especially during this pandemic where, where it seems like they're, uh, they're piling on more and more work and you see people are stressed and people, I mean, you, you hear the reports of how people are doing uh, psychologically and how, how, how they're struggling. But for you to have that witness of that likeness, for you to have that witness of being content, it's, it's, it's a witness. Psalms 147. Psalms 147. We're going to look here at verse 6. It says, the Lord lifts up the meek. He casts the wicked down to the ground. This, this is a picture of the Lord fighting your battles. This is why we don't have to strive. The Lord fighting your battles. And, and, and this is why the, the title of this, I know we're a little into this, but <laughs> the title of this is Meekness Rooted in Confidence in God. Meekness Rooted in Confidence in God. It says, the Lord lifts up the meek. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Again, it's a picture of God fighting our battles. There, there comes a time in our walk with God where at some point we got to trust him. I mean, he's, he's, he's come through back here. He's come through over, over here again and again and again and again. God has shown and proven himself to be faithful. At some point, we got to start resting in the confidence that God has got our back. We, we release our faith. We, 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 bring our, we make our petitions known to him, but then we rest in the confidence that God is going to take care of that thing. There, there'll be some things, like we said, uh, that God will lead us. He'll guide us. There'll be some things that he says, hey, uh, in order for this thing to work out, I want you to do this. But it's still resting in the confidence that God fights our battles, that God is going to see us through these things that we're dealing with. Psalms 149. Psalms 149. It says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Oh, excuse me, verse 4. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. He will beautify. Some translation says he will crown. Other translation says that he will celebrate. It will be a victory for his people. God desires for us to be victorious. And believe it or not, outside of us doing it on our own, there's victory that's available to us. I know many times uh, in our flesh, it may seem like that, hey, if I'm going, if, if, if this, you know, if it's to be, it's on me. That's, that's what the world teaches. If it's to be, then I, you know, I need to make it happen. But, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not advocating idleness. I'm not advocating laziness. But you, you know there's a difference when you switch over into your own strength, when you switch over into you trying to make a thing happen. You, 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 you can recognize when, you know, when you're going and you're being diligent versus you're going about it trying to force something to make it happen. And, and that's, that's where that thin line right there is where we got to pull back and say, God, you know what, I've been beating at this thing and trying to make this happen. God, I surrender. What, what, what is it? How should I approach this? What is it that I'm missing? How, you know, what, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? What is it that, what understanding do I need to have to make me uh, reevaluate, reassess this thing and uh, reapproach it a different way? 
So when you talk about the benefits of meekness, God said that he would guide you. God said that he would protect you. God said that he would lead you. God said that he will increase you. God, 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 for those who choose to walk in that meekness, God wants to, he, he it, it, you, know, you know what it is? It's, it's what Jesus said. He said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy, what is it, that are heavy laden and burdened. Take my yoke upon me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It, it's, God is saying, cast it over onto me. And I will carry it. You don't have to carry those burdens. You don't have to try to force and make things happen. Just follow me, and I will carry things for you. How do we walk in meekness? How do we walk in meekness? Go ahead to Galatians. We said we're going to come back here to Galatians chapter 5. And verse... Uh, Verse 22 in the Amplified Classic, if we can get that back up. And let, let me say this first before we start getting into the how. I understand there's different temperaments. I understand there's different personalities. You know, some people are more laid back like myself. There's other people who are more uh, domineering, more, you know, go after it. I get that. But we're, we're, we're not talking about personality. We're, we're not talking about uh, you know, characteristic trait or your hard wiring, what we're talking about is what God is commanding all of us to do. You know, for those like myself who are laid back, God, and many times in the scriptures, command us to be strong, be courageous. So I can't say, well, you know, God, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm a mellow fellow. I just like the laid back, God, I don't want to, you know, do all that. No, there's times when God says, no, I need you to address this, and, and we're going to see that. Uh, and then on the flip side, now that, God, now that we're looking at scriptures on meekness, the person who may be domineering, the person who may be alpha, you know, you know, whatever those things you may consider yourself, those things does not exclude us from doing what the scripture tells us. Is that, is that good? Is that clear? I just don't, I don't want us to, you know, we, we, <laughs> this, we, we shouldn't be lawyers trying to find loopholes out of doing the word of God. You know, we, we should be lawyers trying to find the law and trying to find what the word says so that we can benefit our lives and to do the things that God tells us to do. So again, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, uh, 22, it says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes. And that's the key, that when, when we're talking about meekness, it's his presence within us. We're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if you're born again, you have received his spirit. So you have already been equipped to walk in, you know, each of the fruit of the spirit. But what we're talking about here tonight specifically is meekness. You have already been equipped to do it. So don't allow the enemy, you know, in any time you find yourself, anytime we find ourselves, including myself, uh, find ourselves walking outside of the word of God, Trace back and find out what lie we believed. Because when, when we just park at and say, you know, well, that's just really not me, there's a lie that you believe. When the scripture and when God is telling us that, hey, this is you, you're born again, you have my spirit, so this is you. So when the scripture is telling us that this is who we are, we cannot pull back and say, well, you know, I'm just a little like... Is, a little like nothing, a little like what the scripture says, and that's what we have to, that's, that's what we fall back on. So it says, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes. His presence within. This is why we can't find ourselves just overly busy, because when you, when, when, and, and I get it, there's, there's, you know, there's work, there's businesses, there's things that's going on that many times demands a lot of your time, but don't let that be an excuse for neglecting finding time to find and, and, and really acknowledge the presence of God that's already in you. Because the less that we find ourselves acknowledging God's presence, 
the more we'll find ourselves drifting from the fruit of the Spirit. His presence is already in us trying to accomplish the fruit of his Spirit, but it's the lack of our awareness of his presence ministering to us. Just like I said earlier, you know, there's times when, uh, you know, th- this, this, this is when, and for myself, this, I'll tell you what I do. When I find myself walking, you know, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit, when I find myself in the works of the flesh, when I find myself uh, easily agitated in different things like that, I fast because my flesh is too high. And, you, and, 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 what I, and I'm not just talking about uh, not eating food. I'm talking about pausing and acknowledging whether it's spending time in worship, whether it's spending time reading the word, whether it's spending time listening to preaching. You know, whatever it is, I pause from my regular routine and my regular activities so that I can get more of God into me so that I can have not, you know, it's not, not, uh, uh, not actually more of God, but, but you, you get what I'm saying, where, where, I, where I can become more aware of his presence that's already there. And, and it's so important because God is there. And like I said, well, like I was saying um, from what I said earlier, there's times where you're put into situations and you can see that there's a decision that needs to be made. And in that decision, you can see that Based upon what I decide, I'll either be honoring God or I will not. You know, you could be having a conversation with your spouse, and, and you can see, if I say this, this conversation is going to go to the left. That's, that's a good thing when you can see it. But there's other times when your flesh is so high, when they say you just react. You know, it's like not physically slap, but a slap, slap back. You know, it's they say something, you say something back. And what that's telling you is your flesh is too high. And so there, there's not that opportunity for meekness to even be employed because we're just on, you know, we're on automatic with the flesh. And that's why I said there's times where you got to pause. Like this is my recommendation is what I do is I pause and I say, you know what? I got I to gotta revisit. I got to uh, refill myself up with the things of God because I just got a lot of noise going on. There's a lot of, lot of things going on. And, 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 it's, and, you know, and it's not necessarily sin. You know, you, you can be, uh, be binge-watching Netflix like I do. And, I mean, if, if, if you find a good series that's got five seasons, seven seasons, it's like, you know, my wife would just see me days go by and I'm just... On my, on my iPad, and, it, and, it's, and it's not to say you can't enjoy whatever your, you know, whatever your show may be, but it's to say when you see yourself operating outside of the fruit of the Spirit, it's, letting you, it's, it's an indicator that, hey, my flesh is getting a little high here. And don't just continue in it. Say, you know what, I need to pause. I need to, I need to refresh. I need to let me, let me go, you know, let me go to replay. Let me listen to what pastor preached five times. Let me just hear it and hear it. Oh, man, I didn't catch that. Man, I didn't catch that the second time. Oh, wow, man, this is, and, 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 and I'm telling you, when you go over stuff, I mean, there, there's messages I've heard, I don't know how many times, there, there's certain messages I have as, uh, as, as oil chains and tune-ups, meaning there's certain messages that I specifically go back and listen to that message Again, in six months, you know, you need another oil change. Six months, okay, I need to go back and hear it again. Like, uh, I'll tell you, for instance, is uh, one of the things I meditate on just periodically, whether my body is doing well or not, is uh, Dr. Dollar's scriptures on healing. It's like, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll be perfectly fine in my body, and I just turn it on. Because I want myself to stay full of knowing God's covenant of healing towards me. It's not... When, you know, something hit your body or hit the body of a loved one, okay, now let me get ready to fight. Stay ready. Uh, so how, how meekness? So when I, when I consider about how you can consistently walk in meekness, 
it starts with how do you view God? Because to be honest with you, to be confident, and this is why weakness, I mean, meekness is not weakness, because to be confident, to be confident to prefer somebody over yourself and still think you're going to be taken care of takes strength. To be confident to let somebody seemingly get the upper hand on you and think that you're still going to come out okay takes strength. To be confident to see somebody and allow somebody to tell you off and you humble yourself without uh, reciprocating that back takes strength. So let's go here to Genesis chapter 13. We're talking about how do we view God? Do you view, do you view God as being able to fight your battles? Do you view God as being able to take care of you financially? Do you view God as being, a, regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances, God is going to make things go well for you? Is that your perspective of how you see God? Or, okay, God, well, I, 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 I believe you, I trust you, but let, let, let me just help you out a little here. How do you view God? Genesis chapter 13, starting here in verse 5, it says, and Lot, as which, and Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelt then, uh, dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we be brethren. Uh, I ain't going to say nothing about the Ebonics, but you get it. Uh, <laughs> it says, uh, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from, uh, from the right hand. Then I, will go, uh, then I will go to the left. And uh, uh, from me, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if, the, if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, uh, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent there. Uh, pinches tit towards Sodom. And when, when you talk about meekness here, it's like you, you have to consider Abram, uh, for lack of better terms, put Lot on. <laughs> you, you know what? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, Abram is the one that got Lot started. Abram was blessed. Abram had c cattle. Ab Abram had livestock. And of that, Lot was able to get some of it. So Abram was the uncle. So Abram was the one with seniority. Abram was the one that should have been looked up to. So, all, you know, when you consider all these things, Lot should have been the one that came to Abram and said, hey, to be honest with you, I'm, do, I'm doing well here with you. You know, my guy that's acting up over here, don't worry about it. I fired him. Everything, we're good. We're good. Okay, we're just going to keep on moving on. But at minimum, Lot could have went to him and said, hey, we're, you know, we're growing too big. Man, everything you've done in my life has blessed me. I think it's time for us to move on. Uh, you know, you go wherever you want to go, and, uh, you know, and, and we're going to go, you know, with what's left over because, man, you've been good. I wouldn't have all this if it wasn't for you. But Lot, the greater, Lot, the uncle, Lot, the one who sowed in, 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 in position uh, I mean, excuse me, Abram, the greater Abram, uh, uh, the uncle Abram, the one who positioned Lot to be where he was, he came to Lot and he said, you know what, wherever you want to go, you take it. And because of my confidence in God, whatever's left over, I'm still blessed. This, 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 this is the picture of meekness. That he, it says he looked and he basically saw a land, and, and you got to consider the times, 
good land was important because your livestock had to eat off of it. So if the land over there was like desert, and you pick the land over here that's good, and Abram says, you know what? I'm going to go over there to the desert. We, we good. God is with us. You know, whatever we got to do, we're, we're going to be blessed over there. This, this is the picture of, of confidence in God. And, and, and the other thing I want you to see is when you talk about meekness, meekness is not weakness. Abram confronted. He wasn't afraid of confrontation. You know, meekness is not just allowing things to happen and not deal with them. He, he saw that there was something going on. He said, you know what? This shouldn't be. This, this isn't how we do things. Man, we're family. Why, why, are we, why are we allowing this to happen? Hey, I got a solution. Whatever you want is yours. I'll take what's ever left over because me and God are going to be okay. This, 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 this is the picture that meekness is, is presenting to us. So that's why I say when you, if, you, if, you're, if we are going to walk in meekness, it takes a, it takes a confidence in God. A confidence in knowing that God has got our back. The other thing we have to consider is what do we think about ourselves? So it's, it's, it's you know, it's one thing to say, man, I, God has got my back. God is good. We're going to make it through this thing. But it's another thing to have thoughts of uh, lack of self-confidence, lack of self-esteem, insecurity. Because when you have those things, there's a lot of internal dialogue that takes place in your interactions, or most of the times, even after your interactions. Where, whereas, you, you, it's, it's hard to even hear what the person that's speaking to you say, because there's so much, there's so much presumption of what you think they mean. And, and, and you'll find that, that a lot of times when, when there's, and, and really self-confidence, uh, uh, you know, being secure, uh, um, uh, self-worth, those are kind of mis misnomers because it really is, is, it's not confidence in ourself, it's confidence in the God in us. It's not, you know, it's not uh, our own self-worth, our worth is in the Jesus that's in us. I know that God has given us gifts. He's, you know, we're beautifully and wonderfully made in, in those things, but it's, 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 it's the creator that made us beautiful and appreciating those things that God has put in us. But when, when you talk about being able to have flourishing relationships, we, we, we have to overcome those insecurities. We have to overcome the, the lack of self-confidence. We have to overcome the lack of self-worth. We have to overcome those past hurts because many times people today are paying a price for the hurt that somebody else has inflicted on us. You know, that, and, 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 and what happens is we are responding to the people, the people that are standing in front of us, we're, res we're physically responding to them, but really we're speaking to the person who hurt us. And, you know, that's why they say hurt people hurt people. I like to also add to that they're easily hurt. Because when, when you're not healed, you know, when you take somebody who's been through uh, some type of abuse or some type of, uh, I'll just say some type of abuse, um, if, if, if you're not healed from that, there, there's the tendency to try to protect yourself all the time. And, and, this, and this is... This is what we were just talking about, is you have to give that battle over to God. And it frees you. Remember, we talked about the peace that is available to the meek. Because it's hard to be at peace when you have these continual internal dialogues. When somebody is talking to you and they're, you know, they, they, can, be, uh, they can be critiquing your work. And in the way that you, when you know that you are healed is you see it that it's just about the work. But when you take it as them trying to say, you know, them trying to assault you and saying that, you know, well, they, they don't think that I'm good and they don't think that I'm smart and they don't think that I can do this. It's like, no, I just asked you to change the font when you use these. It's like, I, I didn't say you don't know how to write it, send an email. I just said, 
we use this font. Can you please use this font? And, and I say these things jokingly, but it's those internal dialogues because the healing really isn't there. And, and rather than having uh, cycles of up and down because, okay, I, I'm, I'm beating it this week, but then next week, you know, somebody says something and then I go into another slump. It's like we, we just got to be healed and we got to begin to meditate on the word of God concerning our self-worth, concerning uh, knowing who we are in Christ. Because then that allows us to deal with people at face value. So they said, uh, change the font. Change the font. No problem. Okay, I got that. And, 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 and to be honest with you, this, this is my persuasion. If you're trying to insult me, it doesn't bother me. Because that's shame on you. It, it's not me. That, that's honestly the way I view things. It's like if, 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 if you're trying to say something to insult me, I'll take the critique I'll do the critique, and if you're trying to assault me, that's shame on you. You shouldn't really be behaving. Uh, me and Sonia have a, a saying, or Sonia really have a saying, uh, is that nice? <laughs> you know, it's like uh, I'll say something jokingly to her, and she'll say, is that nice? I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, just don't, don't even get into that battle of, okay, well, what did they mean by that? And then, you know, Two hours after the, you know, the conversation, you're still having this dialogue in your head. There's no peace there. There's no, and, and it's rooted in fear. Fear that people are trying to take advantage of you. Fear that people are going to hurt you. Fear that uh, uh, people don't uh, have your best interests at heart. And you know what the scripture says about fear? Fear has torment. You're, you're not finding peace in torment. you, you got to release those things. Even if somebody seemingly get the best of me lot, I'm okay. And, and that's, that's, that's the confidence we're talking about in God. So what, what do you believe about yourself? Uh, Psalm 139, we quoted this. I'm just going to look here at verse, uh, verse 13. We'll look at 13 through 15. I'll tell you, this is, uh, man, this is a powerful passages. This, this is a powerful psalm if, if you read the whole thing through, but we don't have time for it here tonight, but we'll just read verse 13. It says, for thou, I'll say, O Lord, has possessed my reins. Thou has covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works in that my soul knows right well. What, what, what do you, how do you see yourself? How do, you, how do you see yourself is going to be paramount to how you interact with others. Because if you see yourself the way that God sees you, you're going to be confident to interact, to love others without holding back, to, uh, to have relationship, friendships with others without uh, this, this fear of being hurt. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not talking about being naive. I'm from New York. You know, I, I've seen a few things, but what I, what I am saying, you know, and, 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 and I understand the diligence, you know, when you're talking about a business deal, you know, read through, the, read through the fine print. I'm not saying you don't read through the fine print. You're just going around, you know, everything is good. Let me just sign my name. Okay, high interest rate. It's like, no, re read the document that you're signing. Do your due diligence. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is don't. Don't go beyond taking things at face value. And just in general, within, within relationships. I have here the other, uh, another thing. Uh, do you inwardly continually see yourself as a victim? You know, when you, when you consider yourself, do, do you see yourself as the victim? You know, I heard, uh, I'll say a pastor, I won't say name, but, uh, but it was powerful. He said, uh, he said, you know, concerning race, he said, uh, he said I, and, and he was a black pastor, he said, uh, you know, I don't get too tied up in all that. Because when you get tied up in all that, and I, I'm not saying, Lord, help me through this. I'm not saying there's not things that need to be 
done for justice and equality. That's not what I'm saying. Hopefully you can follow me with this. Uh, judge my heart. Um, but what he's talking about is where you go around always skeptical of, you know, somebody's trying to get over, somebody thinks they're better than me. And some, he says, I don't go around that. I go around knowing that I have the blessing of God on me. So regardless of their view, I'm still blessed. I'm still going to prosper. I don't, I don't have to worry about whether you like me, whether you don't like me, whether you uh, think that I'm less than you. That's none of my concern. That's between you and God. All I got to do is walk in the things that God told me to do, and I'm going to receive everything that God said I can have. And that's the, that's the mindset that we got to carry. It's like, it's, it, that's not to say that things aren't happening, things don't need to be, uh, you know, the laws don't need to be changed and all that. I, I get all that. But what I'm saying as you as an individual, what is your worldview? Do you go around thinking that everybody's trying to get over on you? Do you go around thinking that everybody of this race thinks they're superior to you? Thinking that everybody of this race is inferior to you? Or do you go around believing and seeing things through God's lens? Hope that came out with some clarity. I know people get tense and tight about stuff. Uh, but you guys see things through the Bible, so I'm not worried about you. Um, whew. Okay, let me hit a few things. So we talked about how you see yourself. Uh, last thing we're going to hit is uh, what is your worldview? What is your worldview? Do you see, is your worldview of abundance, scarcity, just enough? I can tell you coming up struggling as a child, financially, always struggling, single mom, doing everything she can, getting government assistance, doing everything she can to try to, you know, get us through. It took me and takes me renewing my mind to the word of God to get from the just enough. God can be blessing me, but still those old thoughts of just enough, you're good. Not excelling to abundance. And, and, and you have to become aware of that. Okay, what is your worldview? What, what shaped your worldview? And if, it's, if your worldview isn't shaped by the word of God, then you got to renew your mind in the word of God. That's, that's another series that I, or there is another series that I listen to that, uh, that, that talks about poverty mindset that I listen to uh, that keeps washing out some of those old thoughts that I can continue to renew my mind and see things through God's perspective. Uh, do you expect things to go well for you and your family? Do you believe most people are genuine and, and being honest towards you? Or do you think that the majority of people are out to get you or the, the majority of people uh, don't think well of you? Do you take people, at, uh, do, take people at face value? Or do people need to prove things to you? So again, you know, do your due diligence with business deals. You know, if you're getting married, uh, you, 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 there need to be some testing and knowing that this is the one. So I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is uh, everybody in your life shouldn't have to jump through hoops for you to believe every little thing. Let's go here to Romans 12 and we'll wrap up here. Romans chapter 12, very familiar passage of scripture, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Again, there's a sacrifice element of humility and meekness. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, when, when we're talking about renewing our mind, and when we're talking about our soul renewer, soul renewal, we're talking about our thinker, our feeler, our choices. And I, I want you to get this. At the point that something is a thought, it either has to be accepted or rejected. So thoughts can be coming across 
concerning how you see yourself, what you believe about God and your worldview, but you have the ability to accept or reject it. Now, at the point that it's a feeling, your thoughts are in line with your emotions concerning that thing. So you pretty much accepted that thing to the point where your emotions are now invested in these thoughts. But where the rubber hits the road is your decisions. The decisions you make, like, like I said, there can be that internal dialogue of, man, if I, if I say this thing, this conversation is gonna go in the wrong direction. So at this point, even though my feelings may be starting to get invested in this thing, I still have the opportunity to make a choice to, to still bow my knee and walk in meekness. And this, this you know, th again, this is where the rubber hits the road. We, it, it becomes easier when we find ourselves feeding our spirit man on the things of God because then those thoughts are, are there as well and you begin to become excited about doing the things of God rather than just, well, let me yield to the flesh. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Well, I hope you was blessed by the word of God here tonight. <laughs>